Okay. All right. Hey guys, uh, I am Null Sleep from 8 Bit Peoples. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, chip music and chip tunes. Um, the name of the talk is uh, Square Wave to Heaven. Uh, I can't take credit for any cleverness in that, though. It's um, actually suggested, suggested by a friend of mine from Chicago uh, who goes by the name Sascrotch, who also does some chip music stuff. Um, so let's get started. And first question, what is chip music? Um, I think the best description I've seen for it that sums it up nicely and uh, in, a, in a short amount of space is music composed by using, emulating, or sampling digital sound chips. And uh, a Swedish uh, C64 musician uh, that goes by GoTo80 is the one who said this. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, basically, it means that you are you are either using old machines uh, and directly using their sound chips as, as synthesizers, um, or you are sampling small bits of waveforms, so one frame of a square wave, one frame of a triangle wave, something like that, and using that as a looped sample in your tune. Um, or, you know, in, in some cases now, people are just sampling old video game sounds and incorporating them with other types of electronic uh, music genres. Um, where the line is drawn in what is chip music and what isn't isn't totally clear. Uh, different people have different feelings. But what ties it all together is the distinctive sound set that you're working within. Um, there's also a unique attitude that's held by a lot of the particip participants in the community, and that is that um, the the chip music uh, is often very non-commercial in nature. There have been commercial releases um, on vinyl, on CD, and, and so on, but for the most part, it's music that is released for free um, through the web or, uh, or at parties. Um, and the releases, if they are released sometimes on CD, are also very often very cheap do-it-yourself releases. Uh, CDR labels and things like that. Um, this doesn't mean that chip musicians aren't serious about what they're doing. A lot of the times they're very serious about it. But because of the roots of the, the genre, well, maybe not a genre, but we'll get into that later. Because of the roots of chip music, there is a very deep running uh, attitude about making things free or making things open to everyone. The tools to make uh, chip, chip tunes or chip music are also usually free or cheap, uh, relatively speaking, in terms of, uh, in comparison to other types of electronic music. Um, a lot of the times, the software will be released for free. Um, and if there's hardware that's necessary, it will also, obviously, you can't release hardware for free, but people will provide you with schematics for how to build it yourself and things like that. Um, the, I think the general attitude uh, is about openness and sharing of knowledge in the chiptune scene. And there's less ego involved in the, in, in the community than with other forms of music. So you have more of a sense of camaraderie with everyone else that's involved. And uh, just to, to, to clarify something that is a very common misconception, probably not among people in this room, but um, in the general public. We, chip music is not about remixing video game music at all. So when, when uh, you go to a chiptune show, the worst thing you can possibly do is, is scream out something like, play Tetris or play Contra. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard stuff like that. And at first, I would brush it off, but now if you scream that, I'll fucking rip your head off. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's see. Did it go to the next one? All right. Areas of focus. Um, so 40 minute talk, I can't cover everything in the chip music scene. I'm going to sort of go with my personal bias 
and um, try and limit things to hardware-specific chip tunes, uh, for example, SIDs, NSFs, things like that, and sample-based track chip tunes uh, such as mods, IT, XM, screen tracker modules, etc. Um, there's obviously a lot more out there than what I'm going to talk about today. So, chip music as a false genre. Um, this is what I was hinting at a little, a little bit before. Um, and the question is, is chip music a genre? And I would say the answer is probably no. The basis of categorization is um, for, for people calling chip music or chip tunes a genre is that they all use the same sound set. Um, those sort of lo-fi, you know, square waves and, and Uh, agro-cute, which is a uh, reference to high-frequency, fast square wave melodies that are not balanced by lower or middle frequency <laughs> frequencies in the arrangement. Usually octave bass lines originate in pi piezo beepers for handheld games or tamagotchis that can only play one note at a time, gets on many people's nerves, others cannot live without it. 
Um, and it goes on. But basically, you get the idea. There's a, there's a wide range of styles within, within the chip music scene. So to classify chip music as a genre itself is a, is a bit misleading for most people. OK, so moving on to uh, the origins of chip music. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are probably somewhat familiar with, with this. So just going to talk a little bit about it. I think, and this is also open to debate. Everything in this talk is basically personal opinion. And there's some wiggle room here and there. I'm, I may be wrong about things, or you may disagree. But the way I see it, there are two roots. There are two main roots to, to chip music, and that's video game music. Um, so soundtracks of early uh, arcade games or console games, um, where you basically were limited in the number of channels you could use, and there was no um, no samples that you could use. And of course, the demo scene, where you had um, you had you know productions that were being made with graphics, and of course, at first you were just you know adding your graphics to the beginning of games you cracked and released, and then as those uh, crack throws became more and more elaborate. You wanted to add music and show off a little bit more, so that's where the chiptune music came in. And a lot of the times, the early ones were just ripping music from games and would use that as a soundtrack, but then people started wanting to write their own music. So um, what's the underlying theme that both of them share? It's about overcoming the limitations that you're working within and doing the most that you can with the little you have to work with. Um, the hardware was slow. Uh, it, you, you were only offered maybe between three and five channels to work with. Um, so w when you only have three, three channels to work with, you need to cram as much as you can into those three channels. And you need to use all the tricks that you can think of in order to trick the, the listener into hearing more than three channels. Um, how was chip music made in the beginning? So. When, when video games, when, you know, when C64 games were just starting, obviously, you know, your own tell didn't, didn't pull out, you know, a tracker from the company he was hired from and, and write the music for the game. He, he had to code the sound engine himself. He had to, to figure out how to make that sound engine uh, optimized enough so that it could actually run with the graphics of the game and the game logic running along with it. And that's a lot to, to ask of, of uh, a C64. Um, so the, the early chip music was made basically by uh, hand coding assembly or machine language. Um, fortunately, you don't have to do that anymore. There are tools um, that have become available <laughs> recently, you know. Uh, in, in around the, the mid-80s. Um, in 1986, I believe it was, uh, a guy by the name of Carson Obarski released um, Sound Tracker, which was the first Amiga tracker, or I think the first tracker in general. Um, or no, no, sorry, the first Amiga tracker. And uh, he created the mod file format, which I'm sure pretty much everyone in the room is aware of. Um, soon after that, it was disassembled, and this was probably one of the most important events in the chip music scene, uh, the fact that this, this program had been disassembled, because now people started taking that, that source code and creating their own trackers. So this led to a proliferation of trackers, which in a lot of cases improved upon uh, Obarski's sound tracker. Um, so one of the most important was uh, ProTracker for the Amiga. Uh, in a few years later, in 1989, you have a guy by the name of Matt Simmons, uh, aka Format, who decided it would be cool to use only very small looped samples in his Amiga mod. Um, so we're talking one frame of a square wave, one frame of uh, you know of white noise and and just use these very short looped samples in order to get a, a mod file that was extremely small, but also resulted in a specific sound that was more reminiscent of 
C64 music than what people were doing with Amiga music. Because once, once the Amiga trackers appeared, you had the ability to use sampled channels. So you could, you could write you know, techno on the Amiga. You could write Gabber on the Amiga. And there were people doing this. Um, you know, it was like, for some people, it was being stuck in the C64 with its three channels and, you know, limited waveforms, uh, and then being given the opportunity to use sampled sounds was, uh, you know, a huge gift for them. And they, they embraced that and, and start their, their music started evolving. But for others, they, there was something about those old sounds that they really liked and latched onto. And that's when you see that there was a techno technological rift developing in the scene. So technology pr progresses. Chip music is no longer a necessity. Um, <laughs> yeah, you guys are probably reading ahead. <laughs> I can't cover that last one yet. Um, so with the progress of technology, obviously, you can't, you can't slow things down. You have to just roll with it. Um, Music and video games was no longer limited to a few channels. You had full orchestral soundtracks developing for games. Um, when video game consoles decided to move from cartridges to CDs, that fucking sucked, okay, in my opinion. Um, because then you started having people just, game companies basically just grabbing the hottest techno producers and saying, okay, let's. Let's use their tracks for, for this game. So you had, you lost a lot of the character that, that was uh, tied to video game music. Um, and it basically became more like movie, movie soundtracks. Um, you know, it, whether that's a good or a bad thing, I guess it depends on the game. Final Fantasy, okay, you know, maybe the, the orchestral soundtrack works better. Um, but I still say, like, my favorite Final Fantasy is like on the Super Nintendo, which was, you know, it, it wasn't quite chiptune, but it was still sort of that characteristic video game sound. Um, so, so this, so once you have this progress of technology and computers becoming better, and the transition to the PC from Commodores, Amigas, and Ataris, where on those platforms your hardware was basically the same, no matter who you were, if you had an Amiga, you had this hardware, to, to, to a more or less degree. And if you had a C64, you had this hardware. Um, that, that constant was very important in the early demo scene because it, it basically tied you to the limitations of that platform, and you had to do the most you could with those limitations. But once you get the PC and its expandable options, no one, not everyone has the exact same setup. And you're, you're, what am I trying to say? The transition went from doing the most with the hardware you have and, work, and breaking the limitations to more of an emphasis on design. So that's when demos sort of changed from showing off how many, you know, how many um, polygons you could get on the screen or, or something like that or, um, uh, or you know to how cool can I make this fly through look and I think the, that for me the, the demos lost a lot of their appeal at that point because I was most interested in in seeing those technological limitations being broken and, and seeing people brag about, oh, look at, look at how many, you know, metaballs I have on screen right now and things like that. And the demos now, oh, sure, there are beautiful ones, but it doesn't have the same essence to it. And the same with chip, with chip music and music and demos now. Obviously, a lot of demos now don't, don't use chip music. Um, but you did have those people that decided to stay behind and work, continue working on the old platforms and um, continue to do new things with them and still try and push the limitations. Um, also, age of personal com computer begins, fuck you, PC, fuck you. So that's, that's how I feel about it. I, I like the, the idea of having a, a, a piece of hardware that's immutable and you have to do the most you can with it. 
and there are still people doing new things on the C64, so you know, why did we, why did we leave it behind? And this is where I cry. But chip music survived anyway, because of those people, I guess like, like me, who decide to hold on to the past as a conscious choice. Um, and, and there are others that uh, decided to bring the sounds from yesterday to the platforms of today. So these are the people that released uh, chip music discs on the PC, groups like um, Rebels and Beep Dealers and... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if any of you are familiar with Mega Hawks. Okay, I'm, I'm glad there are some Mega Hawks fans um, because they're fucking awesome. Uh, and let's, okay, so, so let me, I'm gonna just take a brief break and I'm gonna play some, some of these. Let me get out of here. I'm gonna play some uh, PC chip music this, disc examples. So here's uh, the first chip music disc from Rebels. So what you have is a self-contained player and packed along with it are a bunch of modules um, that, that various members of Rebels um, track. So you have this, this still distinctive sound from, from the old platforms but on the PC and yeah, it's amazing. The whole thing is like under 300k. Um, so things like this. Uh, let's see. Let's go to the, their second music disc also. And they were, they were making a conscious de decision that we don't really want to use samples in our songs. We don't want to use high quality samples in our songs. We want to stay with those short loop samples and emulate the sounds that we, that we were hearing, you know, as we grew up going through the demo scene and, and making chip music. Um, and then let's see, this is a, a more recent example is Beep Dealers. Um, this is a Swedish music group who unfortunately never, uh, they were supposed to release a second disc and it still hasn't been released, but maybe one day we'll see it. But this was a really promising first, uh, first music disc. And in the center you'll see, this is actually an animation that was recorded on a Game Boy camera. Um, so it's even the graphics are sort of tied to that low-res aesthetic. Um, and this is a track by Zabutom, who's, who's, in my opinion, one of, one of the best PC trackers around, probably. Alright, and last but not least, we're gonna... Go and let's see if I can get the Mega Hawks one up here. I'm gonna have to switch to one monitor. Hold on one second. I'm disabling a second monitor just for this music disc. That's how good it is. Now let's see if I can get it to go to that. Not, might not be able to get it on the screen, but uh, all right. Let me just play. Let me just play one of these tracks for you guys. All 
All right, now I just screwed up the whole monitor setup. <laughs> All right, one second. Sorry, some technical difficulties. Megahawks do not do not want to play. Let's see. All right, I'm going to try and play one of the mods, my favorite one from this music disc. And you're right, it wouldn't happen with a Commodore because of this fucking PC. Um, so let me see if I can play one of these in XM Play instead. Fuck you. All right. Uh, yeah, let's go. All right. Can we get a little more volume? So, so this is a PC music release, and you hear this totally fucking awesome. Like, I yeah, I mean. If any of it, the people that know what I'm feeling right now know what I'm feeling, and the people that don't, there's no way I could explain anyway. So, fucking Mega Hawks, that's all I have to say. Alright, um, so let's get back to, to the boring fucking talk. <laughs> oh shit, now I screwed up, I forgot I screwed up the monitors. Let's see if I can get it working again. Yes, okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, you had the, the, PC, the PC chip music discs who were sort of bridging the gap between the people that wanted to stay behind and work on the old platforms and the people that decided, okay, let's, let's move on. Um, so there was, there was that nice medium to them. And then uh, around 1999, I think you had uh, what was basically a new era of chip music emerging. And this was due to uh, a couple new communities that, that sort of started up around uh, the turn of the century. And I think uh, one of the most important ones was uh, a site called micromusic.net. Um, which uh, in a lot of ways is not strict chip music um, at all, uh, but, but it did have a lot of people that were in the chip music scene sort of were attracted to it because it had a very low lo-fi aesthetic to, to it. It was basically a site where people could upload their music and um, then every month or so a uh, batch of those songs that were uploaded were selected to be put on the site and available for download. And they had a lot of nice things going for them because they had basically a system where when you were signed into the site you could see who else was signed in and you can send messages to them. So what this did was it helped sort of introduce a lot of people that weren't familiar with the chip music scene to, to the scene and it also helped them communicate with other people. So when you had the, the the, that small group of, of people that were involved in the scene talking to the new guys, it was a nice way of educating uh, them about, about the history of what had come before and that this site, micromusic.net, wasn't the beginning of it, but it was just a, it was just a new, a new, a punctuation of a new era, I think, in, in chip music. And in the, at the same time, also in uh, 1999, in November, I started uh, a group called 8-Bit Peoples along with um, my friend Mike Hanlon from Detroit. And 8-Bit uh, Peoples was basically, uh, in the way we originally envisioned it, a collective um, of musicians and or artists uh, who, were who were interested in sort of um, pursuing that the the lo-fi aesthetic both in music and art. Um, the first the first things that I was uh, releasing through 8-Bit Peoples were 
were a lot less chip music than what I release now. So um, my, my definition sort of changed and my interests have sort of shifted and I've become a little bit more of a purist and maybe a little bit more of an elitist, although I try, try to keep an open mind. Um, but, but yeah, 8-Bit Peoples has been going for, I guess, eight years now, and uh, we've, we've focused on music through a lot of our, our history, and, uh, and we've also been involved with releasing art packs and things like that. Um, so along with micro music, I think we did a lot to, to sort of shape this, this new era of chip music. And um, what we shaped it into, I'm not sure if it's good or bad, but, but it, was, uh, it was unavoidable, I think. So another thing that happened around this time was um, the rise of the Nintendo scene, or uh, I prefer my Square Waves unfiltered thanks, because on the C64 you had filters, which gave, gave it a really distinct sound. And of course, the, the NES and the Game Boy don't have filters, and you also have a very distinct Nintendo sound. It's immediately obvious to anyone who, who knows a little bit about chip music when they hear a Nintendo song and when they hear a Commodore song. So this rise of the Nintendo scene was due to a couple different things. Um, LS, uh, two programs called LSDJ and Nanoloop uh, were released, and this made Game Boy chip tunes possible. Um, the, and this was also really important because of the platform choice. The Game Boy is such a ubiquitous um, piece of hardware. So many people have Game Boys, and not only in one area where in Europe, for example, you had a lot of people with C64s. In the US, not so many not so many people had c sixty fours um, in Japan, not so many people had c sixty fours there was there was that sort of geographical disparity between them, but with the game boy, everyone fucking had a game boy. You had uh, people in Europe of course had game boys people in Japan of course had game boys people in the u s had game boys so this was a platform that was ubiquitous ubiquitous enough across the entire globe that it brought together a global community of people that were interested in now making music using the Game Boy. Um, and then in December of 2001, uh, something called MCK was released by a couple of Japanese guys. And MCK is basically an application and a sound driver uh, for writing NES music. Uh, or Famicom music, and this kick-started the NES Famicom chip music scene. Um, there were previous options. Uh, one of them was called Nerd Tracker 2, uh, which was released by a Swedish guy um, going by Bananmos. He actually released Nerd Tracker 2, which was a tracker to write NES music, um, at a demo party in entering it into a competition for the most useless piece of software. Um, so that tells you a little bit maybe about, about the feelings at that time to, to chip tunes and in that particular demo party. Um, but obviously there were people that were interested in writing NES music and uh, to them Nerd Tracker 2 was, was a good option, um, although it, it has its shortcomings. For instance, the reason why MCK's release in 2001 was so important um, was Nerd Tracker 2 didn't even allow things like copy and paste. Um, so it was pretty annoying to work with. Um, and then MCK came along and it offers up its own set of annoyances in that it's actually, uh, it's actually not a tracker. It's uh, an application that you have to write your song in music macro language. So you're basically typing into a text file and then converting it with MCK into assembly language and then compiling the assembly into an NSF file. But it allowed copy and paste because you can copy and paste in a text file. Um, it was also important because it was released by some, some of these Japanese guys, like I said, and that sort of helped to bridge the, ca the gap between uh, Japan's chip music scene and the Western chip music scene. And that was something that was um, for a long time, very separate. You had, in Japan, they were coming from that video game music origin that I talked about, and in the West, 
we were coming from the, more of the demo scene origins. So bringing them together was something that was really basically a, a pretty big event for the chip music scene. Around that time also, um, and mostly probably because of uh, micromusic.net, a lot of these chip music artists decided that they were going to start taking to the stage and playing live gigs. And this started happening a lot in Europe. And then um, around the same time in the US, um, I did I had my first gig in 2001 uh, in New York, and I played Game Boy on stage. And I think there were maybe, maybe 10 people in the audience. Um, but it was sort of, looking back on it, it was, it was a really cool experience. And, um, and one of the people in the audience, I don't know if any of you know of him, his name's Corey Archangel. Um, so that was, that was quarter, sort of cool because Corey Archangel is an artist and he's sort of a darling of the art scene in New York um, who uh, is, has put a lot of focus on hacking NES cartridges and things like that. So it sort of felt like, you know, one of those early punk gigs maybe where there are famous people in the audience even though there's only a few of them. Um, and, then, and then you also had, speaking of punk, uh, in 2003, a Wired article came out written by Malcolm McLaren, uh, who was the manager of the Sex Pistols, and he basically pronounced chip music the new 8-bit punk, and he more or less claimed that he discovered the chip music scene, um, but he phrased it in a way that not like, oh, there's this cool chip music scene, and I discovered it, as in I came across it, but more like, I discovered this chip music scene, and I'm presenting it up to all of you. So a lot of people within the scene didn't, didn't really take kindly to that. Um, so there was a bit of a backlash against him, but some of the, some of the things he was referring to as punk um, maybe make sense, maybe don't. He, he was calling chip music the new punk because a lot of it had a DIY aesthetic. Um, the, the, the tools were, were cheap. The sounds were cheap. Um, things were dirty. And there was a less, less serious attitude in terms of not really, a lot of the artists weren't really interested in pursuing commercial goals with their music. They were just interested in doing it for, for the fun of it and to see what they could do with it. Um, but in general, I think the chiptune scene rejected Malcolm McLaren's involvement. Um, but we do probably have him to thank for, for an increased visibility. Um, well, him to thank or blame, depending on your, your perspective. And uh, the, the, the rejection of him, though, as, as someone, as an outsider to the scene, really showed that the, there's a strong community present uh, sense of community present within the scene and we sort of don't really we don't really appreciate people that that we see as cultural vampires trying to come into the scene and latch on to it and and make it their own um, on the other hand if you're someone that has a genuine interest in it and you want to learn more about it and you come in with a sense of um, a sense of uh, knowledge seeking then then there are going to be a lot of people that will be happy to help you. So moving on, um, now trackers, tools, and tricks. So what are, what are the trackers now that, that people are using? Um, obviously, we don't have to write an assembly language anymore. We don't have to write our own sound engines. Some of these are what I would say are probably these are, these are, in my opinion, the seminal pieces of, uh, of software for, for their respective platforms. So on the Commodore 64, you have uh, JCH Editor by Jens Christian Hoos, I believe you pronounce it. And um, this is something that uh, Commodore 64 chiptune musicians like um, Go280 use. And it's one of the most powerful um, pieces of software for composing music on the Commodore 64. On the Amiga, you have ProTracker, um, which is a sample-based tracker. Uh, 
and, and saves to mod file format, as, as you know. And you also have something called AHX Tracker, um, which I just want to say a few words about. This is basically a, a Pro Tracker like music editor that was uh, designed to create C64 like synthetic tunes. So, this is another example of those. This is an er even an earlier example of you had the people that you know, when they ma made the move to PC, they wanted to hold on to those old sounds, so they released the PC chip music discs, but then you had people that even when they moved to Amiga, they still wanted to hold on to those old sounds, so this group um, released Abyss Highest Experience is what AHX stands for, and it was designed to actually, yeah, create C64-like tunes on the Amiga. Um, there's no support for sampled instruments, and uh, you have basically an average AHX tune is about 200 bytes, um, or up to 5 kilobytes. Um, all the waveforms of the C64 are supported on a triangle sawtooth square and white noise. So this was, this was a tracker that was pretty unique on the Amiga. On Atari ST, you have uh, Music Mon 2, which has been used by um, a lot of the YM rockers and uh, a lot of, I, I think, also used by Bodenstandig 2000. Um, on the Game Boy, you have LSDJ and Nanoloop, which I've mentioned. Um, LSDJ is, <clears throat> is a four channel tracker. Um, Nanoloop is sort of, uh, it's, it's an interesting program. It's not really a tracker at all. It's, it's, it's interfaces based on a four by four matrix of squares that you basically drop things down into. And yeah, it's, it's not my style of music making, but it's, it's something that a lot of people have done really interesting things with. Um, Carillon Tracker uh, or Carillon Editor is a tracker for the Game Boy that's specifically geared towards uh, making Game Boy Music for demos, whereas LSDJ is specifically focused on just making Game Boy Music. It's actually way too CPU intensive to, to be used along with a demo, really. On the NES, you have uh, Nerd Tracker 2 and MCK, which I've mentioned. You also have a relatively new tracker called Fami Tra Fa Tracker, which is um, the first what I'd call the first modern NES tracker. Uh, it runs um, in Windows, whereas NeuroTracker 2 requires a DOS environment. And um, progress is still being made on it. The, the author is still working on it, and it, it looks really promising. It's also interesting because it actually um, incorporates a elements of uh, MML, which was what, what you used to program for MCK. Uh, within the tracker, so you actually define your volume envelopes and duty cycle envelopes um, as MML commands. And then there's MIDI-NES, which is a cartridge uh, that you plug into your NES and you can basically use your NES as a, as a synthesizer module controlled over MIDI. Um, all of these things are basically designed to to help you get the most out of your hardware. So the, the trackers will employ glitches in the, in the software, or in the hardware to sort of fool, to sort of do things that the, the, that the designers of the hardware never intended it to do. And then as a tracker yourself, you are also trying to figure out ways to trick, uh, trick people into hearing more than is actually there. So you're doing things like which we said before, creating arpeggios, so playing uh, through three notes super super quickly to, to fake, uh, fake the person into hearing a chord um, is very common in, in chip music. You also are doing things like manually creating f echo or delay effects, um, so within one
by Mortimer Twang, who is one of my favorite Amiga musicians. This uh, song is called I'm the Passenger. And you can also hear the, the range of styles just in the three so far is, is pretty immense. Here is an Atari ST tune by Pazza. Flipping around a bit. And here are some Game Boy tunes, first by Bitshifter. Um, and here's one by Random. Here you hear that, that simulated echo effect that we're talking about done really well. Very distinctive style for the game. Um, and then let's play a little bit of uh, Naruto's Artificial Intelligence Bomb. This is uh, one of the, probably the best, the, the best chiptune music composer in Japan probably is this guy, uh, Naruto, who unfortunately disappeared from the scene a while back, but we're hoping for a comeback. Definitely a distinctly Japanese style of chip music. Um, it's something you can imagine almost like an anime uh, opening theme. Uh, and let's do one more for the NES uh, from Zik, just to show you a difference in, in approach. Obviously very different uh, from Naruto's track, and the last one I'm going to play is uh, a PC mod from, uh, from Vert. Who sucks? Because he's not here. <laughs> yes, who sucks because he is not at this party, and he is in the U.S., so I'll kick his ass when I get back to New York. Um, this is from his first FX EP released on Monotonic Net Label. So this is done in a sort of Castlevania style, um, emulating the NES, but actually a PC module. And I'll leave you with just a few places um, if you want to if you want to check these places out. More tunes to be found. High voltage. Archive8bitpeoples.com, 2A03 Music Archive for NES Music, also has very active forums uh, if you want to get into NES Music composition, and probably the most important site, uh, I would say, is Mork.org, a uh, video game or chiptune news site um, run by a uh, guy in Japan that goes by Halley. Uh, Probably the most important site for tying together the Japanese and Western chip, chip music scene. Um, so that's it for me. Thanks a lot, guys. Yes, yeah, some, some, uh, not all of the hardware had stereo capabilities. NES music is only in mono. Um, for example, Game Boy music, on the other hand, it does have some stereo capabilities. Yeah, if anyone else has any questions, sure.
Okay.